Good morning, Emmanuel. It's me, Caleb, from the lobby of Emmanuel. One quick announcement this morning. Um, in front of you, in the pew rack, there's a card called, you guessed it, the Connect card. You might ask, what do you do with the Connect card? Well, there's different ways to connect on the Connect card. If you take it to the front, uh, there's a place for your name, all your information uh, for Emmanuel to reach out to you. We will not put you on some spam email list. You don't have to worry about that. Also, next steps, how do I get involved? What about uh, baptism? I wanna know more about Jesus. What can I do to be on mission? That's on the front. Then on the back, how can we serve or pray for you? Fill that out. Um, have a question about Emmanuel, fill that out. These things get answered. I don't know if you've been on the receiving end of that, but I have. People actually read these cards. They reach out to you if you got questions, concerns, prayer requests, etc. cetera. Um, if you need more information about how to connect with Emmanuel, where might you go? Well, you guessed it, the Connect Desk. You might be saying, well, man, there's a lot of desks at Emmanuel. Which one is it? It's the one that says Connect. Shout out to Brian Bobel for making this awesome desk. Anyway, that's all I got for you, Emmanuel. Love you. Have a great day. All right, good morning, Emmanuel. Thanks for being here with us. We're so glad you're here. I want to invite you to sing with us, join with us this morning. If you'd like to stand, that's fine. If you'd like to sit, that's fine too. We're going to get started. Emmanuel Church. If you're tuning in online, we pray that this service will be a blessing to you. But if you're here, welcome. To everyone who's exhausted, to all who mourn and long for comfort, to all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. To everyone who fails and desires strength. To everyone who sins and needs a savior. This church opens wide her doors 
with a welcome from Jesus, the Savior. He's here, and he's welcoming you. So let's stand. If you're already standing, just stay there. (laughs) God sent Jesus to proclaim good news to the poor, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to declare a new era of God's favor for the undeserving through faith in Jesus Christ. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. The Lord be with you. Let us worship God. Thank you. 
and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing, great.
You can be seated. Um, so we're coming now to celebrate this awesome thing that the Lord does, but it also kind of feels like a punch in the gut at the same time. But it's for the glory of Jesus, and we love the glory of Jesus. Yeah. Now, as many of you already know, Charles and Kendra Tolbert are going to be um, moving to a different part of the front line for Jesus here in Nashville, in East Nashville with Church of the City. Charles is going to be a student pastor there. And we're excited for you, brother. Also, you and Kendra have found your way down deep into our hearts. We love you. And so nothing but the glory of Jesus could get you out of there, out, out of our hands, that is. You're not, you're not going anywhere in our hearts. Um, and we're, we're so happy for you, brother. And we celebrate this. And we want you to know that we feel like a piece of our own heart and Emmanuel DNA is going with you. Oh, it is. To Church of the City. Yeah. yeah. So we actually have um, a video from Pastor Matt Smallbone, Church of the City in East Nashville. We're going to show that now. Hi there. My name is Matt Smallbone. I'm the lead pastor of Church of the City in East Nashville. I'm a big fan uh, of your church. Ray Ortland is an absolute legend uh, in, in our field. <laughs> I just want to send you a, a quick message to let you know that we've uh, invited Charles Tolbert to join our team in a full-time capacity as, a, as our youth pastor. We, we've been praying about filling this role for two years. Uh, Charles' background story and uh, his education and experience has uniquely positioned him uh, to serve the community that we serve uh, really well. We, our church is located less than a mile from, from Nashville's largest affordable housing. Uh, development. Our youth group comprises 40 or 50 of Nashville's most at-risk kids, and, uh, and Charles's life uh, positions him uniquely to serve us well. So we're thrilled that he will be joining us. Uh, Kendra is an old friend of ours, and we're excited uh, to welcome her back. I, I know this is a, a bittersweet moment for them as they have loved their season with you, but... Uh, we want to say thank you uh, to the team there and their generosity in, uh, in allowing Charles to join us, and we would value your prayers as, as we seek to see the way of Jesus interact uh, with, with everybody over here in East Nashville. Love you guys, and uh, we will look forward to uh, staying connected. Yeah. Wow. Man, that's, that's great. Yeah. So you're going to East Nashville. We're staying in West Nashville. You take the east for Jesus. We'll take the west and we'll Deal. meet in the middle. <laughs> <Deal>. <laughs> you know, Charles and Kendra, um, as I've said to you, you both together embody a radiant uh, beauty um, because you're filled with God's spirit. And we're really going to miss your presence here. We're so grateful for what you have given to Emmanuel. Now, a couple questions. Um, we always love to celebrate wins. What evidences of grace have you seen the Lord giving you through your ministry in the, uh, in the youth here? Well, first I just want to say it is an absolute miracle to see how the Lord is working in teenagers here uh, at Emmanuel. Their understanding of scripture, um, you know, we've been going through uh, the sermons on Sunday mornings and uh, just dialoguing about that and just seeing them growing each and every week in their understanding of the gospel has just been an absolute joy. And uh, all the leaders and the volunteers, we constantly say, man, look what the Lord is doing through these through these teenagers. It's, it's incredible. Um, and then also just they're they're been growing in community with one another. So to see them laughing and caring for one another has just been an absolute joy. Um, our parents uh, who have been so supportive and so encouraging to us. Uh, we're so thankful for them, and, and they sort of create the homes that these kids are coming from, and that is a testament to God's grace at work in, in the families here at Emmanuel. And also, 
Um, it's been a huge joy to work with the pastors, the elders, the deacons here. Um, I can honestly say that if there was anything that we needed uh, in the students' ministry, you guys made sure that we had it. And I just want to say thank you for that. Wow. Um, and then the church community, um, you know, first off, I want to say thanks to our volunteers who sort of set the tone each week with being vulnerable and walking the light and showing these kids what it means to serve. And uh, it's been a joy working with you all. Um, and then also having um, several people from our congregation speak at encounters and for men and women to be heard by our students that they see, uh, you know, both men and women who love scripture, who love Jesus, who God is being real to. And just connecting with the kids ministry and the 50 plus class. I mean, it's just there's so many ways that our hearts have been filled with joy and God is doing so much there. And uh, we love you. The, the ministry has grown through your influence and a huge team win. We're really grateful. We're, we're stronger because you were here. Yeah, we thank right. you. Now, okay, so you're going to the church of the city. How, what, what is the, there's a longing way down deep in your hearts because I, all you guys are living for is, is the Lord. So as you go, what are you longing for and how can we pray for you? Yeah. Um, so as, I, as we were thinking through this, how can we be praying? You know, the thing that came to mind was Charles, when he was sharing with the students last week about the transition, he shared Exodus 33. Um, and the part that really just sticks out to me in this season is um, when <laughs> Moses asked the Lord to go before him. Because if he doesn't, what's the point? Yeah. You know, and so that's one way you can pray is just the yeah. Lord would go before us um, and his presence would be in us and through the leaders that are going to be serving alongside of us. Because yeah. um, that's, I mean, the hope isn't in us, it's in Christ. Yeah. And so that's the first one. And then the second is for wisdom, where, as kind of Matt mentioned, it's going to be a really unique um, community with a lot of challenges and hardships. And so. Um, just for wisdom of what it looks like to serve in a way that we serve well, and it isn't just what we think is going to fix things, um, but that God would just really give us wisdom, and especially Charles' wisdom, um, as he leads and steps out in faith. Um, so just for the gospel to be made known through the both those areas. There's nothing greater. Yeah. Mm. Direct hit. Thank you. TJ, why don't you lead us all in prayer for these friends? Yes, absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Charles and for Kendra and for the work of grace that you have done in them and through them for us. And Father, we do pray now that you would go before them, yeah. God, that you would be their rear guard, that you would be making straight their path. And Father, we do pray that as they um, face into uncertainties, that you would guide them every step of the way, that they would feel as if we are being shepherded along by God. And Father, we do pray for a massive work and outpouring of the Holy Spirit and work of grace there through Church of the City in East Nashville. We pray, God, that 20, 30 years from now, there would be pastors and teachers and mothers and fathers who love Jesus in this city and who are lifting burdens in this city because of the work of grace that you've done through Charles and Kendra there at Church of the City. And God, we pray that Jesus would be seen for the redeeming Savior that he is mm -hmm. and lives being changed, God, trajectories being changed for generations mm -hmm. to come because of the investment that you are doing in Nashville through Charles and Kendra and Church of the City. And we pray for Church of the City that you would just bless their yes. socks off. We pray that Church of the City and other believing churches in Nashville who lived high the name of Jesus would just be absolutely flooded with more people coming to hear about Jesus than they can even handle. Mm -hmm. And God, we pray that Jesus will be made non-ignorable in this city yes. and that anybody just visiting from out of town to Nashville would know, good grief, these people are serious about Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray that Jesus would be the talk of this town yes. and that this movement from with Charles and Kendra going to the Church of the City would be one piece of that. Mm -hmm. And God, bless them, protect them, mm -hmm. keep them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's thank Charles and Kendra, shall we? All right, can we back up to the last slide? I forgot to mention that. Yeah, tonight at Hurry Back on Elliston Place from 5 to 8, we're just going to have a drop-in honor time for Charles and Kendra. 
So uh, please join us, and it'll be great to get close to them and make a memory together of how great it is to be one in Christ. We're going to miss them so much. Thanks for putting that on your calendar. Okay, now. <laughs> we have literally waited 10 years for the next two weeks at Emmanuel Nashville. This Friday is Good Friday. I don't know what sin you're lugging around in your heart. Not that you want it, but it won't let you go. I've got mine. And I'm saying, why don't you bring that very worst moment in your past that you find so threatening, you don't even want to think about it. Why don't you bring Friday night at 7 your worst sin? Because Jesus is bringing his best grace. And however horrible your, your sin might be and mine, there's no way we can defeat His grace. He washes away every stain. And we're going to come together on that day when He died, and we're going to share the Lord's Supper together, Holy Communion. We're going to take into our very bodies these tokens of His dying love for the undeserving. That's Good Friday. Then next Sunday morning is Easter. Um, let's go back to the other graphic. Yeah. And I'm going to preach from John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So much darkness in our world today. It's coming in from the right. It's coming in from the left. But the darkness cannot overcome the light. When the light shines, the darkness hightails it. It's all darkness can do. And after this world, all its top people, all the experts and the professionals, judged Jesus worthy, worthy of death and a humiliating, not a heroic death. He rose up from it all. So what are they going to do now? They got to deal with him. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it and never will. And then... The next Sunday will be our special 10th birthday celebration. Man alive. <laughs> By the way, Easter Sunday and two Sundays from now, our 10th birthday, both times we will not have anything happening at 9 o'clock. We'll just have the cafe open. We'll come together and just have great coffee and hang out. In him. Whoa, all whoa, the whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> um, and two weeks from today, this dear, dear, dear brother, I believe one of America's most wonderful and significant pastors, will be our friend and our guest to bring the gospel to us at our 10th birthday In celebration. Him. <laughs> what is it? What is it that I'm confused? Oh, it says go. Okay. <laughs> In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In the wilderness wanderings of the children of Israel, they had no permanent dwelling place. They would uh, live in extended stay, but temporary tents. 
And the tabernacle where they met with God was, was also temporary. And then Solomon builds a temple to God. But in 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, he asks, will God really dwell on the earth? Heaven and the heavens of heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built? Nothing on earth can contain the living God as a dwelling place. But the Bible says, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. You know the greatest thing about that man? He has a great sense of Christ. And he's going to give us that priceless gift two weeks from today. <laughs> oh my goodness, I can hardly wait. And as you know, it seemed good that rather than spend a lot of money on a big party, we're going to spend a little money on a lunch. And we're going to give that money away we would have spent, plus a lot more. So two weeks from today, after church, I, it, this sounds as though it's not a big deal, but I don't know how else, to, how else to say. It's a free lunch. It's a good lunch. You will like it, but it doesn't cost anything. It's right down in the gym. So put that in your calendar, too. Two weeks from today, we're just going to have fun. We're just going to hang out. And we are, to celebrate our birthday, pouring out our money to end slavery, Tennessee. Because Jesus cares so tenderly about those who have been treated brutally. And we care. And oh my goodness, you guys, I am so proud of you. Here's, here's an update on our $20,000 goal. And you know, that's where we, there's the goal. And that was last Sunday. And here's where we are now. <laughs> hey, let's make it an even 100,000. <laughs> because two Sundays from now, Derry Smith, the leader of N Tennessee and Slavery Tennessee, is going to be standing right here. I really want to hand her a check for $100,000. Help me out here, will you? So you can make your check out to Emanuel Church, put End Slavery Tennessee on the memo line. Every dollar goes to those precious girls and women who are being cared for and raised back to life. You can put it in the uh, yellow envelope there, put it in the um, uh, offering in just a minute. This is our last Sunday to get after it. Let's do this and have fun doing it. Wow. Isn't that great? Hey, Emanuel Church. You're awesome. You're making it look like Jesus has come to town. And what could be greater than that? Way to go. All right. Now, we don't understand it, but we love it. Now we're going to stop. We're going to pray because God is real. And in our weakness, we just talk to him about his glory and our needs. And he delights to hear, receive, and answer our prayers. And listen, if you don't quite know how to pray, don't worry about it. He'll fix it on the way up through the perfection of Jesus. So however it helps you to just get into prayer, let's do that right now. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Oh, Father, we live in an evil day. And we ourselves contribute to it. And we're so sorry. So, Lord, we pray right now for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit into our hearts to cleanse where we have dirtied ourselves, to heal where we have wounded ourselves, to forgive where we have sinned against you. Lord, Lord, we turn to you as the darkness deepens. And when every false hope has betrayed our trust and given way in failure and collapse, we turn to you. We're not turning to you as our great fountainhead. We're turning to you as our last resort. And even so, you still receive us. We're so grateful. And so as we are turned your direction now, we're listening to you. I ask you in this hour to come down through your spirit, dwell among us, have your way among us, touch each person here. Lord, kiss them right on the cheek and then send us out of church, Lord, energized, encouraged, hopeful, forgiven, with a spring in our step and sparkle in our eye that we might live for you this week. Lord, we pray for Good Friday, Easter Sunday, our 10th celebration. We ask you, Lord, to fill us at these events with historic blessing. We want to see in our generation what only God can do. For that we pray and we dare not pray for less. Pray in the holy name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus will receive our tithes and offerings. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you.
Hey Manuel, I'm Megan. Um, so this series on coming alive to God has really been huge in my life. Um, as far as showing me just how dead I was to him and also having those breakthroughs of coming alive to him. Um, so in the past, I have committed some really, really bad sins. Um, I was a pregnant teenager and terminated the pregnancy through an abortion. Um, and you know, I just, I just felt unforgivable and abandoned and unloved and just worthless in our father's eyes. Um, but on the day we talked about Isaiah 6, um, I just was overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit's presence that he had filled me with this peace that I was forgiven. Um, and that no one was too far gone to find their way back to their father's arms. And that I was loved. Um, so I guess barriers I had let my feeling of underqualification um, <clears throat> and my just pure guilt get the best of me and thinking that I was too far gone for anyone to ever think of being a Christian. Um, but I've definitely had huge breakthroughs. I've been pouring out to him way more than I thought I could. And he has kept every promise through that. Well, we're so thankful to Megan for that, for the privilege of entering into her life and God's grace toward her. You know, here's a wonderful thing. When Megan goes to be with the Lord, he will welcome her in and her child will in glory welcome her in. So, gosh, we just love the Lord. How can we not love somebody like that? All right, let's open the Bible. <laughs> I'll try to get it together here. <laughs> okay. Oh, Acts chapter 4. Uh, if you're using the Bible in the pew rack there in front of you, it's on page 912, Acts chapter 4. Page 912. Beginning at verse 23, it says, When they were released, that is, when Peter and John, two of the leaders of the early Christian church, were released by the authorities. They had been arrested. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, 
who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. This is God's Word. In the early church, prayer was not an option. God was all they had. Maybe we today have too much. Maybe with our so much of our own know-how and our own methods and our own brilliance. Maybe today we're treating God as an added ingredient to make a good thing even better. But if we are not a church of prayer, we don't understand who we are. A biblical church is not a monument to our glory. A biblical church is a miracle for God's glory. God is not an upgrade. He is our life. And he wants us to come alive to him not as if he were a garnish on the side, but as our very breath. The key is to be poor enough so that all we have is God. How was the early church so compelling? They not only had no power, they were under the thumb of the powerful. So what did they do? They did not gather together and draw up a five-point strategy of response. They did not even draw up a five-point strategy and say prayer should be first on the list. They weren't that calculating. They just fell to their knees. They not only needed God, they had God, and they knew it. And they did make the real Jesus not ignorable in their city and far beyond. Now, obviously, these early Christians were not Americans because we today, modern Americans, we're just more practical. I mean, we know how things really get done. So we have our plans. We have our methods and so forth. And practical wisdom does have a place. It's in the Bible. It's in the book of Proverbs, for example. But in the modern church, we put the primary emphasis on secondary things in the early church, they put primary emphasis on the primary thing, the living God, as their mighty fortress. And they were just simple, weak people like us, and they were unstoppable. Well, ha, now it's our turn. God wants to retell this story through us. Now, if you're new here today, and especially if you do not yet believe in Jesus, you have every right to expect us to be a praying church. If you don't see that in us, 
you have no reason to take us seriously because we are not taking God seriously. Something else is going on here. If we are not a praying church, our problem is not that we need to become Methodists or Anglicans or whatever. Our problem is we need to become Christians because Christians treat Christ as real. In fact, more than real, we treat Christ as the super reality above all other sub-realities, including ourselves. And if you do find in us a praying church treating God as real, then you might think we're crazy, but we really do believe in Him, and then you have to face what you really believe. This story in Acts chapter 4 answers three questions that will help us become a movement of prayer. One, who is the God we pray to? Two, what should we be asking Him for? Three, how can we know when He is answering our prayers? And here is what must happen among us today. We as a church are now being brought to the place where we can turn a corner from wondering if we have time for prayer to treating prayer as our very oxygen. Now, here's the choice we face. We as a church. God will either set us apart to himself through prayer or God will set us aside because of our non-prayer. Which is it going to be? Number one, who is the God we pray to? Verse 23. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, here they quote Psalm 2, they know it by heart, they're praying the Bible, that itself is very interesting. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus. By the way, that's why we have to do things like end slavery Tennessee. And everything else is broken in this world. It's not, it's against Jesus. When we stop being against Jesus, we start treating each other like the royalty he says we are. And the root of every evil in this world is we're against Jesus. I mean, if we're against Jesus, we'll do anything. We're capable of anything. Truly in this city we're gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, a whole new political coalition, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. God is a Calvinist. And so were these early Christians. They saw him as the sovereign Lord. We ask, if God is sovereign, why pray? They asked, if God is not sovereign, why pray? The one we're praying to is not limited at all. What has God done with his sovereign power? It's interesting how the first thing they do is they rise to pray, is they rethink who God is. What has he done? Three things. One, verse 24, sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. He is the God of the universe. It's big to us. It is small to him. The whole universe. You know, like, I'm, you know, you could, might be standing somewhere flipping a coin like this. That's what he does with the universe his little toy universe. He likes it. But here's a video about our little part of the universe.
And that's just one rather non-spectacular galaxy. I went onto the NASA website to find out how many galaxies there are out there. Here's what I found. One of the most fundamental questions in astronomy is that, is that of how many galaxies the universe contains. The landmark Hubble Deep Field, taken in the mid-1990s, gave the first real insight into the universe's galaxy population. Subsequent observations, such as Hubble's Ultra Deep Field, revealed a myriad of galaxies. This led to an estimate that the observable universe contains about 200 billion galaxies. The new research shows that this estimate is at least 10 times too low. And here we are <laughs> in off the side of the, like the boondocks of one galaxy. Why should God the Creator be impressed with the tiny ant armies arrayed against him here on this tiny planet over in a corner of the universe? We're praying to the one who owns all power. He's not intimidated. That's the first thing God did. Secondly, Verse 25, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, you said, by the Holy Spirit. And then they, as I said, they quote from Psalm 2. They quote it by heart. Psalm 2 paints the picture of this whole world, all the intellectual, political, military, social forces that usually are fighting against each other, all of them joining together on one issue as a worldwide coalition on one issue. They don't want Jesus getting too much influence around here. And Psalm 2 is not talking about one moment in history 2,000 years ago when the Lord walked in this world. Psalm 2, the whole point is, it is summing up the whole of human history, including our day. Now, wonderfully, there are individuals in politics, in entertainment, in academics and so forth who love Jesus, but the system doesn't love Jesus. And God told us in advance in the Old Testament, it would play out this way. God is not caught off guard. He isn't nervously working on plan B. His plan A is succeeding, and his enemies are a part of his plan A. How can they defeat the one who wrote them into his script? And that leads us to number three, what he did, verse 28. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Oh, no, there it is. There's that scary word, predestined. Strong word. And maybe you don't like that word. I don't know, but I'll tell you, it really, when life gets scary, that word comes in handy. The predestining authority of God is why no authority in all this world can stop Jesus. And when the power of the gospel collides with the powers of this world, we prevail, not by flexing our muscles, but by falling to our knees before our sovereign Lord who predestined it all. We take heart, not by looking around at present trends, but by looking up to his eternal plan. And we rejoice because we're winning. If we're aligned with Jesus, we're already a part of the kingdom of heaven. That's point number one. Who do we pray to? Number two. What should we be asking God for? Verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats. In other words, Lord, we really, 
we don't even know how to understand it. We just push it toward you. We refer this to you. Look, you deal with it. Look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. I like the word all there because there are different, there's like 31 flavors of boldness. Um, well, we could think about that for a while. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They did not start a boycott. They did not circulate a petition. They did not ask God to bring the hammer down. They prayed for God's healing power to spread out into their world. While you stretch out your hand to heal. They are not advising God. They're not even asking God to improve their circumstances. They're not asking God to take the danger away. They're asking God for the one priceless gift, the boldness to press through the opposition. Boldness is the key word in Acts chapter 4. It appears three times in verses 13, 29, and 31. And this word translated into English as boldness is a compound word in the original with two parts, all plus saying. All saying. So that helps us understand what boldness is. Boldness is a way of speaking that gets right to the point and doesn't throttle back, but says it all. For example, the Apostle Paul said, I did not shrink from declaring to you all that God wants you to know. That is gospel boldness. Let's go for it. We do not prevail by winning. We prevail by not shutting up. In these days of angry extremism in America, we face two opposite dangers. Cowardice and craziness. And we can drive into one ditch on one side of the road or the other ditch on the other side, but the wisdom of God keeps us going straight ahead in gently blunt boldness for the gospel. Not stabbing Jesus in the back by our cowardice or our craziness. We can't be Christians at all without boldness. There is no Christianity without boldness. C.S. Lewis said, you can't write a good story without danger and therefore without courage. Why did Lewis say that? Because if a story is going to matter, if we're going to care about it, something must be there worth fighting for. And God has put us into that kind of story. Jesus said, do not fear what you are about to suffer. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Who else can give us that guarantee? Survival is not our goal. Boldness is our goal. We used to sing a hymn. Here's just one verse. Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. Every church that's alive to God has a taste for battle. We aren't happy unless we're gaining new ground and liberating more people from the devil's prison camp. And when the struggle gets hard, we don't complain. We deeply believe we're just lucky to be involved in the greatest cause on the face of the earth. This world did its worst to our Lord, and he rose from the dead. What are they going to do now? And if we have him, what, what should we fear? Back in 1949, the year I was born, Howard Guinness, this, this little book, Sacrifice, by Howard Guinness, published by University Press. We were so not cool in 1949. This is actually held together by staples. Somebody took the paper and stapled two staples here, and they actually offered that for retail sale. 
Brian Bobel would never create graphics. <laughs> this non-sparkling. Here's some questions he asks in that book. Where are the young men and women of this generation who will hold their lives cheap and be faithful even unto death? Where are those who will lose their lives for Christ's sake, flinging them away for love of Him? Where are the adventurers, the explorers, the buccaneers for God, who count one human soul of far greater value than the rise or fall of an empire? Where are God's servants in this day of God's power? We can be weak, guys. That's all right. Not a problem to God. But we can't be neutral. We as a church are saying to our Lord, here we are for your glory in this generation and the next. We're not asking you to make life easier. We're asking you to make us bolder. Lead on, O King Eternal. How could it be otherwise? The whole Bible from cover to cover is a story of courage. It's a story of boldness. It took guts for Abraham to leave home for who knows where. It took audacity for Moses to confront Pharaoh. It took courage for David to go up against Goliath. It took bravery for Elijah to confront the false prophets. It took nerve for the early church to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. They went from Palestine to Spain in 40 years. 40 years. In one generation, churches were planted. And it's going to take courage for us to make the real Jesus not ignorable in our city and far beyond. And that is precisely the gift that God will give us in answer to prayer. God makes cowards into heroes. Here's how it happens. When the, it's, we know from uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul had to give his defense before Caesar, the most powerful man on the, on the face of the earth. So here's the Apostle Paul standing there, probably in chains. Caesar is there on his throne, maybe 15 feet away. And the Apostle Paul is explaining himself and offering a defense for everything he believes in and lives for. And he says, he writes to Timothy. It's almost as if he's saying, you should have been there. He says, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. So there's the Apostle Paul standing there doing the talking. And as he's speaking, he, he feels this presence, maybe just right off to his right, you know. He feels this presence. <laughs> he realizes the risen Lord is right there. And he, he feels this arm around his shoulder, and he feels this squeeze, and he hears this voice in his heart, you go, boy, you're doing great. The Lord stood by me and strengthen me. The reason that's in the Bible is the Lord will stand by you and He will strengthen you. Number three, that's what we pray for. Number three, how can we know He's answering our prayers? Verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the Word of God with boldness. Now, I don't know if God will shake this building when we pray. He didn't shake the building on the day of Pentecost, and that was not a minor blessing. He didn't shake the building on other occasions that were pretty amazing. God proves himself in many ways. He's not limited at all. That is the whole point. The Bible says our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. So we don't tell him what to do. We're happy for him to choose. 
He is not there to wow us. He is not in show business. We're here to be open to him, and we don't mind his upheaval coming down from above. In fact, we love it. We love the idea of God shaking the place up. But if your purpose in coming to church is to be shielded from change, if for you, church must make your life more predictable, you don't understand who we're praying to. (laughs) And when he answers, you won't like it. But if you long for your life to display his glory and to make progress against evil, you're alive to God. And when he answers, you will love it. We love to track with evidences of grace here at Emmanuel. We love to celebrate wins, as we were doing with Charles and Kendra earlier. This this 10th birthday celebratory gift to end slavery, Tennessee, that is an evidence of grace. God God is filling us with his spirit of generosity. We're giving boldly. Wouldn't it be glorious to see God shake this whole city? We're not okay with the status quo. We're not asking God to sprinkle his pixie dust blessing on the way things are. Wouldn't it be great to see the Lord break down dividing walls of hostility and set the captives free and spread the gospel with a power that sweeps us away into new obedience we've never dared to dream of? That's what church is for. And the Lord is moving among us and he is shaking us and it's not because we're psyching ourselves up. It's because we've been praying and God is answering. I am asking this morning that every one of us will consider his or her ways And if in any way we are still marginalizing God, we will turn a corner. I am asking every one of us, all of us together as a church, that's what this is about, a whole church together at prayer, a church pervaded with a spirit of prayer. I am asking every one of us to step into the rhythms of prayer here at Emmanuel because... God is real. Many of us are serving in so many ways, but I'm asking that every one of us will commit to gathering for prayer at least once every month. Here are two opportunities among others. One is Quiet Fanatics, led by our dear brother, David Tolbert. The Quiet Fanatics are asking God to pour out upon our city a new era of peace and justice and humaneness. We cannot work that up, but we can pray it down. So we are praying for God to detonate an explosion of the love of Christ in this city, starting with us. The quiet fanatics meet in Pastor's TJ study on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock from 9 to 10. And as you know, the next two Sundays are special celebratory Sundays, so the Quiet Fanatics will resume three weeks from today at 9 o'clock. Will you go pray with them once a month, one time a month? I'm asking you to commit to that now. Here's another opportunity, frontline prayer. From 10.30 to 11.30 in the staff working space, we believe that this worship service is carried along not by our talent, but by God's grace. So the frontline prayer people are praying right through the service from 10.30 to 11.30. Then at 11.30, they come in and join us. They slip in at the back. They continue to pray right until the end of the service. They are praying that we might be filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word with boldness all through the upcoming week. Frontline prayer will also resume three weeks from today. I'm asking you to commit now one time a month. 
You will miss the service. You will not miss the blessing. All right? There's my sermon. We have many shortcomings. We have many weaknesses. But I believe if we will be a praying church, God will put upon us a Christ-like radiance our city will not be able to ignore for long because he is non-ignorable. Join me in that, and let's see what God will do. All right. Jess, band, why don't you come lead us? Let's stand up, guys. Let's get after it. I think in heaven I'm going to be a drummer. I just love that. Uh, we don't ever want anybody to walk through the doors of Emmanuel Church without somebody else looking them in the eye, actually shaking their hand and saying welcome. So let's take 30 seconds and do that right now. Go.
Okay. So, like, we know what steps we need to take now. And if you want to connect with Frontline Prayer with Quiet Fanatics, you can go to the Connect desk out in the lobby and tell them, hey, I want to get connected to one of these things, and they'll hook you up. It's been so good to be in church with you today. If you would, raise your hands and receive God's benediction as you go. Grace, mercy, and peace. From God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.